not like a decision, like, let's be farmers. It was like, we had a little bit of land and then we got a little bit more and then we got a little bit more and then... Hi and welcome to Seek Sustainable Japan. In this episode, I had a chance to visit the organic farm of Heather, who runs Nagano Naturally. She's been doing organic farming in the Nagano area, just above Matsumoto City. And she has so many great insights, uh, talks about what she's growing, and really comes through with her passion for not only better, more sustainable farming practices, but also how to build community, how to support other farmers. There's so many great insights here. Hope you enjoy it. Hi, I'm Heather from Nagano Naturally, and this is my main growing field. Um, we don't own the land, uh, we rent it, we have the freedom to grow whatever we want here. Um, there was nothing here when we uh, got it. The people who owned it were paying someone to just run a tractor over it to keep it wheat free. So, but that means that there'd be no chemicals because there'd be nothing growing here for a long time. So that was a big plus for us. Uh, we've been in the neighborhood for 17 years. And we started this, uh, we started, we started you know, it, it, it was not like a decision, like, let's be farmers. It was like, we had a little bit of land and then we got a little bit more and then we got a little bit more and then, but I think the apples are in their eighth year, I think. Um, and the rice paddy is 11 or 12. Um, but yeah, everything is just um, slowly, like we take on more. <laughs> And then once you get the tools, like the same machine you use for harvesting rice, you use for harvesting wheat. And the same one you use for threshing rice, you use for threshing wheat. So, and I love pizza and bread. And so I'm like, well, why wouldn't I grow hard wheat? Like, yeah. <laughs> so it's all kind of like, it's sort of like started like that, like kind of like a domino effect of, well, well if we're going to do this, we might as well do that. <laughs> I was wondering why so much of the farmland was covered in soba. Uh, the people who farm them are usually the grandparents generation and as they get older younger people want more time with their kids or they just don't want to take on the field and there's a company that comes and uh, will grow soba on it you can harvest soba two to maybe three times a year here and it's a very low payment it's a but you get your field is in use which is good for the field and I think there's some kind of tax thing in Japan about unfarmed land that's farmland and farmland like if it's land that's in use so there are more and more and more soba fields around here um, I don't that's, why, that's why we should eat soba though because there's a lot <laughs> growing in Japan right but the idea is that there are, it's run by one company who send out employees in huge like John Deere tractors and the big New Holland tractors and I guess I'm, I'm nostalgic I liked it when I knew my neighbors and we were here each day and we could chat and I, now it's like a guy who comes you know once every month and they check it out and make sure and the planting is done in one day and this is just massive tractor from morning to night just going up and down but again you know someone's livelihood and i, I, I think it's right? mostly organic because it doesn't need it i don't think it's like yeah we want pure organic soba but an upshot of it being very easy to grow and very quick to process is the, um, and they definitely don't spray herbicides because they, there's, there's weeds all through it. And one good thing though is they also don't have time to come and um, brush cut their edges. So I feel much less pressure. <laughs> it's, if you're gonna have an absent neighbor, at least one who doesn't care about overgrown like edges, I'm like, yeah, okay, I can work with that. But it does change the, um, changes the kind of the atmosphere. Like there's fewer cars, down the street there's fewer people to like you know every now and again if when I'm doing something and I'm like you know if I collapsed like I would know that like the, the people here and I like if, if I saw his truck was running for a long time or if, you know we would be able to check on each other and I feel like you know there's no like agreement but you just kind of feel good that you know that you're not out here alone and there are some jobs that I won't do if there's no one like if I'm doing the the very steep um, weed whacking on the side of the rice paddy I'll make sure that there's someone in the next field <laughs> I mean, no pressure mate but you know <laughs> if you see me fall over and start screaming come and help me <laughs> but I, I do think that there's something about um, the community of farmers when you get a company farm 
there's just less people around. Yeah. You know, back in the old days. <laughs> so yeah, so there's, there's a lot more soba and every year there's more soba. So this is our wheat field and usually I'm the one with too many weeds annoying my neighbors but and we don't usually till because we would prefer to keep it in green cover but this is cow silage and they let it all go to seed a couple of times this year and the birds carried very helpfully masses of it over into our field and I just the way it was growing I just had a feeling it was going to be competition for the wheat so we've had to um, till the field which hurts a little bit but again there's perfect and then there's what you have to do <laughs> so um, and it's surprisingly tough grass <laughs> it's still it's the second time we twice in a week we ran the tractor over it and it's still coming up <laughs> so <laughs> cow silage for the win <laughs> we just dug up our potatoes and this will go into autumn vegetables probably beetroots and carrots and autumn greens so that's on the to-do list hasn't happened yet <laughs> <laughs> and then next to that um, morohea which I think is molokai uh, it's a like a, it's eaten as a summer like a vegetable to refresh you and then a whole lot of eggplants I grow about five different kinds of eggplant these are sprinkler poles so um, we oh, that's a good idea. Isn't they're, it? They're, but they're not ours. Okay. They're run by the community, which means that they're run on someone else's schedule. <laughs> oh. But it does. It means that, like, we, we dry farm. Other than rain and these sprinklers, um, we don't water. So um, it's very helpful. But it means that you can't mow easily or anything. So we grow rhubarb and figs under the line of the sprinklers because if you're going to have an area that you can't access, you might as well use it. So So is this rhubarb underneath? Yes, this is rhubarb here. Now, the rhubarb had a really rough spring. We had like almost no rain and it really like died down and then it got hot in July and then rhubarb is like, it's amazing. It just came back as soon as we started getting the rain. Um, I think the roots are protected. These are, this is every year I put a new layer of the wheat straw. So there's, it's waiting there. And I just every I don't remove the old one and it just slowly breaks down and I find that the soil under the layers of is cooler and moister so I think the secret to the rhubarb surviving even summer without being watered is that the roots are protected and like the, the corn is protected so but yeah I was really excited because when I was flagging and feeling tired I came out here and like the rhubarb it's growing back <laughs> And these are our apples and we initially wanted to grow Granny Smith's, the green apples, and the guy next door uh, grows all his own apples. These are all just come down in the last couple of days. But, um, they so, still look good. Yeah. They still use part of them. <laughs> we, yeah, we, we, we use them for stewed apples. They're, they're, we're still a few years away from having apples to sell. Every year we get a little better, but um, we realize one of our big problems is the rootstock is um it's called waika rootstock and it's designed purposely to make weak trees that produce more fruit um, mm. and so if you look at the apples next door the red ones through here they're all grown down the branches are purposely pulled down and we were trying to grow up in a, a really natural farming method and uh it's just going against nature <laughs> and also we don't thin our apples because we want as many apples as possible but again the root stock is not um, designed for it so you can see where I planted new apple trees the two at the front and the one here and the couple back there and I this time I knew what root stock I wanted and so different but it's a learning experience <laughs> 
I'd love to see more people educated about how to do it in a way that you don't have to. But I think also it's a big, you know, it's a big risk for someone whose entire livelihood is growing vegetables and you've done it the way your great grandfather and your grandfather and your dad did it. And then to be like, guess what guys, I'm putting it all on the table and rolling the dice. We're going to go organic from this year. I just think that's, you know, I understand why people don't jump in it. Like I wish there were more programs and support that would help people. But I also understand why people, you know, are a little leery about it because yeah, I think it's understandable. Well, you were told that that was one of the things when we talked on the show. Mm. Uh, you were told, oh man, you're never going to be able yeah. to farm without chemicals. Impossible. Moody, what are you Moody. trying to do? <laughs> and, so and, have you converted anyone? You know, I, I, I've, uh, three different people now do their home production completely pesticide free. One's complained, she's like, you get green caterpillars. I'm like, yeah, and you pick them off. Like, <laughs> But people are also, it's really interesting to me that you can be a farmer and also be a little bit heebie-jeebie about bugs, which like I'm like, you know, yeah, there's a caterpillar. And I get them, I'm like, look kids, I found another caterpillar. Like, <laughs> um, But yeah, I think like the idea of the perfect vegetable that has no bug holes, no anything, um, is something that your entire family works for every year. It's very hard to accept seconds, but a, a number of the, the younger women, like the yome, the wives, have been very impressed and they're often more into like wanting to feed their children more natural things. So yeah, three different people have partially or all moved towards it. And also the idea that you don't need to have a bowling green as a lawn that you know this is actually it keeps the ground cooler it you know collects more water um, so we mow a lot less than it but again <laughs> we have to keep it in um, like if during the season when there's dandelions I do have to come and mow more because there seems to be a hang-up with dandelions that I just don't understand like to me they're beautiful and they're not really like in anyone's way but you'll notice there's not a single dandelion on anyone's apple orchard so I, I, like I said I still don't understand why but but again like I can understand it's a really big deal to them so you know I try to be understanding but also my I don't think it's necessary to have a bowling green in the apple orchard and I've got so many jobs to do <laughs> this just falls way down priority <laughs> but um but yeah it's interesting how people have gone from being like oh to being yeah, that's not going to work you're crazy to being show me how you did that and like the comfrey leaves too they were like uh you know what's that and I was explaining how comfrey works and it turns out it grows wild in some places like there's there's some in places that it just comes up and they had no idea about like the the you know the beneficial effects and they love the idea that you just chop it down when it gets too big and it just keeps coming back so and do you use the comfrey for anything i use the leaves as um fertilizer so i'll pick the leaves and put them in a and they go revolting and then i use that as like a liquid pick me up for tomatoes and um, passion fruit and things that are heavy feeders we try to not fertilize as well we're, we're actually we do love we just don't water and we don't fertilize but it's all about like the natural like building soil not feeding the plant but the comfrey leaves like there are some things that just you know tomatoes just need extra an extra boost so um we'll use either comfrey leaves or the em bokashi liquid the, i don't know uh, microorganism um fertile um composting system but yeah other than that it's all pretty all natural but yeah so I, I, if I was being logical, I would just cut down all of the apples and start again with the proper rootstock. But it took me so long. Like I literally grafted them. They were like I grafted them myself. So I I can't give up. There were little 30 centimeter sticks when I started, and I'm like, they cut this far, and everyone's like, yeah, but they're not going to get any further. Like you're growing the wrong rootstock. I'm like, I know, <laughs> I know, but don't listen to them. <laughs> But there is a big difference. The ones on the right rootstock have fewer pests and diseases. So, yeah, one of these days we're going to have to get tough. <laughs> so what does that mean, the right rootstock? So when they grow apples, they have a, um, a graft. So this, this is the tape. It's the left of the graft. So the top part is like the Granny Smith or whatever, the eating apple that you want. And then the bottom part is um, a very hardy, probably not with an edible fruit, but you can, it determines the characteristic of the tree. So if you, you see like as dwarf nectarine or dwarf apple, like, the, the, like the, they grow in people's front gardens, those are all just dependent on the rootstock. So they've got a rootstock that won't grow big. 
um, and there's different rootstocks that for different styles of um, orchard like with different characteristics and until about 10 years ago it was all about weak trees that would produce more fruit but it would have a life of about 10 years and before that they had the grand old apple trees where like you know you see the ones with like the prongs holding up old branches and they were like 30 years 50 years but you would get less production and just it's harder to harvest if you have to keep moving a ladder or in and out of different branches so yeah each time they change it there's a reason for it but it's not necessarily best for the tree it's usually best for the farmer <laughs> so When we, had, yeah. when we had really little kids and I didn't know anything about it and I'd be like, do you get a timetable when they're going to spray? Because where I'd lived before, when they do helicopter spraying of the rice fields, everyone would get like the public announcement, like tomorrow from five to seven, they'll be spraying. So close your windows, bring your washing inside, that kind of thing. And I was asking everyone's like, what do you mean? I'm like, what, what? Like everyone just sprays their apples when they've got time. And I'm like, well, like, do I need to keep my children inside? Do I need, and they're like, why? I'm like, well, cause you're like, no, nah, no, nah, it's no problem. And so I was like, okay. But then the first time I saw a guy with a sprayer, he was wearing a respirator a mask and full like plastic raincoat I'm like yeah it doesn't look like no problem like no problem would not be need a respirator <laughs> so I think yeah people who've grown up around it and I think they have a different way of thinking about it and it's true that the ones they use now are replacements for ones that were completely bad and illegal and like you there was a you had to officially return chemicals to the city they came and did a thing like you like you definitely can't throw this out you can't dump it down like so those chemicals were retired and the new ones came in so i think people are like oh no this is nothing like you should have seen what we used to use and like yeah okay comparatively better but like you say i'm i'm still a bit like funny about and when they sometimes they put like a chalk in it so they can see that everything's been sprayed properly and you know that like the leaves are white like it's not like a, a teeny tiny little spray like it's a drenching so I can imagine that rubbing up against the leaves there's got to be something you know rubbing on you because yeah, again my idea of a spray was like you know with a garden I was like shh, 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 shh. but when they put the one with the the market in it so they can see that all the trees got sprayed I'm like that's a drenching that's not a <laughs> that's completely different to my image of what a spray was so. yeah. So yeah. beautiful. So there's um there's the canning tomatoes are in there and there you just go in and harvest them all at once so that's it's uh, why canning tomatoes do you, are they no good in salads or? uh italian romas so they've got no juicy they're all outside skin no pulp okay um and when you make sauce that's what you want so you don't want the seed bit i eat them fresh they're very like umami no sweet they're very like a strong tomato oh, flavor which is lacking in most yeah tomatoes in Japan. so when they first started growing them in my neighborhood and everyone was like oh you know the first year all the farmers were like check this out and then i was like oh wow like what do they taste like and they're like, oh they're terrible and i was like what and so i got one and i'm like oh it's like a real tomato like i don't like the sweet tomatoes like i just to me a tomato should have like a savory and they were like big and you could make a slice and have a hamburger with these massive slices of tomato but they're all going yeah oh they're like they're like sour and i'm like no no that's a tomato flavor <laughs> so yeah to me i eat them raw as well but um they're definitely not popular um in japan for that kind of thing these are the um vine tomatoes so i've got um can i walk through yeah go for it um, it's been it was a very hard season for tomatoes um, really and just because, because of the, the timing of the rain the or? rain and the heat all came at the wrong time um, so yeah a lot of the tomato people have already pulled their vines okay but because I had such a bad season and because I still got quite a fit, bit of green and a few green tomatoes I'm kind of hanging on and seeing if I can get like a early autumn second crop of tomatoes oh. so but yeah, so, and these are all, again, we don't water. I mean, we water when we plant them. So I start these from seed in February. Um, and then we look after them for like the first month after we plant them out at the end of May. But after that, they just, they have to live. <laughs> but um, they do get the, um, when they're getting started, they're the ones who get the comfrey leaf, um, the, the nutritional supplement. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, we do, none of our, farming is watered so it's kind of survival of the fittest <laughs> if everything's looking super wilty i'll come out but it takes me about 200 liters to 
give enough water to each yeah you've plant. got a huge area and it's just yeah with the, all the things that you've got to do and i don't want to buy in straw because i don't know what's you know what's been on the straw um and we use the reusable one on the pumpkins mm -hmm. but um i weed whack the aisles <laughs> i'm not good at it and i tried using reusable on the tomato and i just i chewed it up and then you have to stop and unwind it from it so yeah like i said something i'd like to move away from but for now with the balance of my personal life and my work life and how i've you know the time i've got to afford to give to everything it's just a necessary evil <laughs> yeah well you gotta do what you can yeah, do yeah and i mean i think it's important to have a goal and to be like you know i want to be plastic free but i think it's also important like if i said okay i'm not going to grow tomatoes until i can grow them plastic free i'd be missing out on tomatoes <laughs> so i think being aware that's an issue and you know hoping to work, move away from it i mean you know i think i'm probably being a bit nice to myself but it's also it's a step it's being aware and i do i like every spring i check out what are the new things what's available um one of my neighbors tried this biodegradable plastic which was a disaster it's supposed to be when you finish your tomato crop you could just run your tractor over and it would all break down in the soil all that meant we had like black plastic confetti over the entire neighborhood for like weeks it was and everyone was like what's all these bits of black plastic so i think like the idea was there but I think the technology is not quite there. Um, so it's supposed to degrade into the, the soil, soil eventually. But the idea was... So is it plant-based? Yeah, it was corn-based oh, okay. with something. I, I, can't, I don't remember all of the details, but it was, it was like the, the brochure sounded fantastic. Yeah. It was quite expensive, which is why I was like, ah, oh, you know, maybe but I'll think about it. it's the same color as the cheap looks the same, stuff. everything. <laughs> um, but it just, oh, no. I, I don't know whether you were supposed to wait for rain or there was too much. I'm not sure what happened, but it just did not biodegrade. And it was there months later, just flapping. In <laughs> and there was another one which they had, but uh, Nagano has a really high UV factor and big, like it was, uh, it broke down in sunlight, and but it was supposed to be enough to get you through one season, but it was like melting. It was really weird. It was kind of like, you'd get like a split that would kind of melt apart, but the whole point is to keep the water in and the weeds away. And it wasn't even lasting one season for the tomato farmers. So again, they were like, well, okay, we're back to regular plant. We tried, we tried. <laughs> and I mean, I love the idea of reusable stuff, but I also understand why other farmers are like, I've got way too much to do to be carefully re-rolling all of my fabric. But, um, but you know, everyone does <laughs> what they can do. You, do you know it as sun choke? Jerusalem oh, yeah, yeah. artichoke? Jerusalem artichoke, yeah. 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 Kikuimo, yeah. So they're not, a choke or anymore they're uh related to uh i think they're related to sunflowers they have like really big yellow flowers and then the tuber comes from the base yeah they're good for the soil and they're also they're like one of those wonder foods for blood sugar i get i'm not sure that the diabetics I, I get orders from diabetics so i think it's got something to do with um that but um i just they, they just taste like roast potatoes to me i'm like they're good okay. i heard they also make a good soup i haven't done it myself but i've heard like a potage type soup what do you use the straw for, for this cover? is a straw that goes in the, around the rhubarb okay so this is last year's <laughs> this is last year's harvest and then this year's harvest will just go on top of that and under that is the year before and you can see it's just completely broken down it just becomes soil so every year we just add a new layer to the top and then i keep some back and i'll like fan it out after the first frost when they die down just to try and um snow is insulating but it's before the snow and after the snow when they can just get frozen so i put like you know like those they do it really properly in the japanese gardens you know with all the straw and the, i just like put straw over and then in the spring i just pulled all that off and put it around the rhubarb as well so it all it all goes together to be in theory could you use the straw instead of the black plastic yeah if i had enough if you um, had enough and you can see you still have to be on keep on top of it because um the straw does break down in to soil so weeds will come through it um, but up there there's a few beds where I can show you where I've done that uh, for strawberries and artichoke where I've it's just straw but um, we have rice straw from the rice paddy and this straw but the people who want straw are the chooks the rhubarb the artichokes the strawberries 
so you're kind of like okay you can have that and then we do it around the apples as well it's like okay you can have that much <laughs> so um and then we also try not to take we try to leave some in the rice paddy because we don't use any fertilizers so it's all like the cycle of only what's broken down in the rice paddy goes back into the rice paddy so yeah every year you kind of like you got this big pile of straw it's like having this massive pile of money or something and you're like but now how are we going to use it okay so this much goes here and this much goes so um yeah it's every year it's kind of like as i try to expand the area that i do in straw i have to be like do i want to grow more wheat so that i can have the straw when i don't really need that much more wheat which is kind of wasteful because i could be planting something i do want but then i want this so yeah so yeah every every march i get this i get a notebook and i start doing all of these like you know where am i going to grow which thing and then i cross it out and start again it's, it's, it's small so excitement of, there's a lot of planning yeah in yeah yeah I mean, I'll show you here. So I grow all of my vine things together so that, again, I don't need to access this until the end of the harvest. So this is sweet potatoes and then butternuts and other pumpkins. And it's grown on the recyclable um, matting. That recyclable matting, it's still plastic. And you know, I'd like to move away from that. So how about around the actual plant, where it needs to get established, I will put the plastic. And then where the vines are gonna to come together, if I, before they get vined, if I go through there with my weed whacker, get it down, chop and drop, so that the, the weeds that you've cut are gonna become a mat, then the vines will take off and I won't need anything. How natural is that? Yeah, so you can see in here, the butternuts are completely, like there's birds are not getting them, they're not getting sunburnt, they're not getting split, but, as far as my neighbors driving past are concerned, that's a problem. There's grass seed everywhere. And, you know, like, I, no one said anything. I think I've built up enough kind of like... Cred. Yeah, social credit <laughs> to, to be able to get away with this year. But I think next year I need, I need to have to put down straw or think about putting mat down. But, you know, I wanted to try it. And I was convinced if I could get the timing right. I still think if I could get the timing right, it might work but every year the temperatures are different the rainfall is different so you know i keep notes of what i did on what day but it's not always useful the next year i got myself a smaller blade on my weed whacker so i think if i try it again next year i'll be able to be a, like you know more of a craftsman and get around the vines because i don't i really don't walk in here at all once the vines are done um so i feel like if I could, you know, do like kind of a belly dancer through them and maybe cut it just one more time. I think if I got one more cut, then the vines would take off. Or grow sweet potatoes because they seem to block out the weeds much better. I feel like the sweet potatoes. Is that sweet potato yeah, the, right next the to the dark green leaves or the sweet potato? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I feel like maybe the secret is that they're the ones who don't need the weed mat. And because the pumpkin leaves, you can see when they get too hot, like this time of year, they die back. Whereas the sweet potato leaves don't die back. So yeah, now next year I got something new to try. <laughs> we wanted to try the no-till permanent bed thing. Um, and we planted asparagus, strawberries, artichoke and rhubarb. And uh, again, it's just got straw just every year new straw and uh, on a year where I've had a helper if I get them to just clear the beds it's worked out no problem I had an explosion of strawberries this year Is this, well, that's a female doing? asparagus that's why it's got the red berries. The red berries that's a female asparagus and then these will the birds eat them and they drop and then you get like self-sown asparagus coming up wow. Do you have asparagus in here? Yeah, this is all asparagus, all of the fairy bits. Mm -hmm. um, That's then, gone to seed? Yes, yes, yes. We only harvest asparagus in the spring and then you let them go like this until the autumn to replenish their roots. Like if you cut them off too much, they this is how they get the nutrients to go back into their rootstock to get them for the winter. So we leave them to go all hairy. Um, but yeah, so this, this bed got away from me this year. Um, is this you, strawberries, yeah. these leaves? So the thing, it used to be one row of strawberries in the middle, so it was very easy to weed. And then a couple of years ago, I started that thing where you take the, the children from the, the old ones and you just replant them. And it was successful. 
but like ridiculously successful. So we had amazing amounts of strawberries, but it's made it so much harder to weed because <laughs> instead of being one line and then you could just like, you know, go up this side with the weed whacker and go down the other side with the weed whacker and keep on top of it. Now it's hand weeding and uh, yeah, as you can see, it got away from me, but I'm, you know, I feel like every spring the, the, you know, the strawberries die back in winter too so and the weeds will die back and i'm confident that if i can get on top of it it was worth it to have so many extra strawberries are these your pumpkin Halloween, right? way too early for halloween right <laughs> we <laughs> I, got two more months again they and they just got it's been too hot and everything has just matured like this is about like three weeks to a month early than what they should be and is that just so much hotter than it's just usual? so much hotter than usual um and like there's splitting and sunburn and i already pulled some and tried to store them in my like i've got a kuda like a storage but it's just not cool enough yet and they just they're just not keeping so i've decided to keep them on the vine for as long as possible but you know last year like when i, I don't, look at this this is an amazing like a really amazing it's big size, but, but it's yeah. going to be way too early whereas other years they haven't been ready till November or monkeys ate them all so or <laughs> do you get monkeys coming down here yeah 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 yeah. monkeys and bears so and but, do they wipe out your crops sometimes? they'll just take one bite out of each one and go that wasn't delicious that wasn't delicious that wasn't <laughs> delicious like I said I would be happy if they wanted to eat a whole pumpkin and get full and go home I'd be like one for you one for me like I'm good with that you know we're living with nature but when they take one they're so smart they can get over the monkey fence get down here they should be smart enough to go that orange thing didn't taste good that looks the same so I won't try it like I it's all I'm asking all I'm asking is to you know not take one bite out of every pumpkin <laughs> it just seems mean okay it just seems it's just, mean it's like vindictive <laughs> right <isn't it>? yeah <laughs> personal right yeah it's yeah like personal attack I want to put a little sign going they're all the same <laughs> yeah, so then this one's artichoke of with the beautiful purple yeah, flowers? Yeah, the globe artichoke. Gorgeous. And then... Um, so has that been... Have you let it go to seed or...? Yeah, so I harvested some and I wanted to collect seed to try and replace some of the... the they, I've had these about eight years now and oh. some of them just didn't come back this spring. So I thought I would let some of the them go to flower and then use those um, but like I said we had after a hot spring we had like a lot of rain and I've got like a late like this is this is ridiculous this time of year there shouldn't be still artichokes coming up but like yeah so it's like everything after like everything died back from being too hot in spring it's like they had like a second spring like the rhubarb and the artichoke kind of went oh rain must be spring and I got all this new growth and like yeah really happy looking after I mean you can see on the rhubarb all of the these are all leaves that just just wilted and died at the beginning of summer and now it's like this time of year it should be wearing out and like you know having a break and then we get a tiny little second flush in autumn and this year it's just gone oh this is spring cool we're on board <laughs> so yeah it's just been so a very would you strange. harvest and eat this or are you just going to let it go to seed? I'm not, I, th I wanted, because I was worried that about the, um, like what was going on, I just mm. wanted to see what would happen. Like when they first came up, I'm like, are they, are they going to keep going? Like what's going to, so this one I've just kind of left to see, um, like those ones I left up for seed on purpose. Uh -huh. But this one I was just so intrigued why, how so I had artichokes at this time of year, but they look good. So I mean, they, this is what it should look like at the beginning of spring. It's just, it's just, I can't work out this year. The, it's just, everything's just been really topsy-turvy. Wow. And uh. such beautiful flowers. Yeah, yeah. And then the seed is, oh, it's, 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 once the seeds are mature, you can just pull the, the oh. fluff and the seeds are on the bottom there. But yeah. Like this, I'm sure we've had hotter one days or two days, but this long stretch of just endlessly hot days, I feel like is... Which has been, what, 35 most yeah, days, th right? th between the, over Here it's between 30 and 32, but just endlessly. And all of these white, um, this is all to sunshades on the apples because the apples are getting sunburnt. And a sunburnt apple has no flavor where it's sunburnt. So again, you're getting to like, we're famous for apples, but the climate is getting so that it's no longer 
easy to grow apples so that's like really like does your head in a little bit like how can yeah how can we stop this like you know is it is it too late to stop or how can we i don't want to just adjust you know right. i want to be like you know there's something wrong like can what, you start planting different things that it, yeah they're, they're already um a lot of like they're trying blueberries and they're trying um yeah different things as well but and also just different types of apples different ways of growing them um you see where the white curtain is here they're only like 40 centimeters apart each apple tree and is it i can't think what it's called where you grow them um, in really long, the very last row mm -hmm. of apples, where you grow them in um, long skinny apple trees. And again, that's supposed to be another way of growing them that's more heat tolerant or more something. But I mean, that, again, that's a big investment for a farmer because an apple tree this size is going to produce so many more apples. Then and you start again, you cut them all down and start from scratch. And for the first two years, you get nothing. So, you know, and it's all based on the fact that, well, this time we'll be able to keep up with the climate as we have it now, but in two years time, <laughs> when you start getting, you know, or 10 years time, when you finally get return on investment, who knows, right? So it's all a little bit. And they're joking that, because we have a um, sister city in Mia that we swap Mikan for apples. And they're joking that, you know, we won't need them in a few years. We'll be growing Mikan, ha ha ha. And I'm like, Mikan, <laughs> hopefully not. Bananas, <laughs> yeah. mangoes, what's yeah, next? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, it's really, Crazy. yeah. Crazy. Okay, so do you want to head to the rice paddy? Yes. Okay. Oh, so, they're still doing silkworm. That, that around? factory there. I, I'm pretty sure it's just research now. But yeah, there's uh, all the whole neighborhood used to be in silkworms. It's so beautiful around here, Heather. Yeah, I, I like it. We, we, when people say like, you know, do you like living in Japan? And I'm like, I love where I live. Yeah. I mean, so these are nashi. Okay. So I get it, and the nashi farmers love it because they spend most of their time under the canopy. So they're right. the only ones who don't have like a really hot jaw. So more soba. <laughs> and this is our rice paddy. Beautiful. So. Unfortunately, the battery died right as we arrived at her organic rice paddy. But this is a great excuse to come back and see Heather's farm and visit with her and hear more insights once again in the future. Thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Please write your questions and comments below. You all seem like such nice and actually, this is my house. <laughs> Lots on the inside and nothing on the outside, but we really like it. Yeah, like, it's really cool. You can see Heather's latest updates on naganonaturally.com and order her delicious vegetables and fruits. She also sells seconds that can be sold at supermarkets from her neighbor's farms. Big thanks to Casey Bean once again for providing the wonderful background music. Please support his original tunes by going to Bandcamp. As always, thanks so much for watching and listening. I really appreciate your support. Please make sure to share with people that you think might be interested. And I'd love to hear your point of view if you'd like to reach out or comment below. Take care. See you next time.